So one of the best ways to get patients to have a better growth hormone release is to get them sleeping better. These are grouped together because while they are slightly opposite in the sense that when growth hormone is high, IGF-1 is transiently low and then flipped, um, they work in concert together. So here's our big schematic view of the uh, GH liver axis, right? Starting up with the hypothalamus, we have growth hormone releasing hormone, and then SRIF, which is basically our uh, somatostatin, which puts the brakes on growth hormone. That goes down to the pituitary. The pituitary can also be stimulated by ghrelin. Ghrelin is the hunger hormone. When you start feeling the rumblings in your stomach, that's ghrelin and then that has an impact on growth hormone release. So growth hormone releasing hormone and ghrelin contribute to growth hormone release. Somatostatin, which has the brakes on growth hormone for most of the day, stops growth hormone release. Growth hormone goes out into the periphery, goes to the liver, where the liver hits, gets that message and makes IGF-1. It's not just the liver, Muscle cell, different cells in the body can also take the growth hormone and make IGF-1, but it's the liver that does the predominant production of IGF-1. That IGF-1 gets bound to, there's several different proteins. The main one that we look at, because it's the main one that it binds to, and you can measure this on a test, is IGF binding protein three. IGF-1 unbound is very transient in the body. Okay, it gets cleared away pretty quickly. The binding protein increases the, uh, the half-life of IGF-1. It's like it, having it testosterone travel around on sex hormone binding globulin. and it sticks around longer because of that. And then that IGF-1 is gonna diffuse into tissues and have its effect. So, <clears throat> When we are looking at uh, a few different things that we can start doing, and this will this is kind of our mini segue into peptides, is looking at how we can increase production of growth hormone from the pituitary gland and doing so in a more natural way. Okay? So recapping, here's our pituitary gland that's gonna secrete growth hormone. We have somatostatin, which has a set, I think there's like six, of them, a set of receptors that it hits. We have the growth hormone releasing hormone receptor here. And we also have the ghrelin receptor here, which this will come into play when we start talking about peptides, the growth hormone releasing peptides that we can use clinically stimulate this receptor, okay? The one thing I want to mention here, actually we'll wait until that comes up. So, uh, big things about growth hormone and IGF-1. So IGF-1 is what carries out the majority of the role of growth hormone, so that's really what we clinically look at. The reason for that is because there is a lot of research showing that if growth hormone is too high in the periphery for too long, that seems to increase risk of cancer. So we don't want patients to just be doing growth hormone injections for the rest of their life because that could come with an increased risk of cancer. Men and women have different pulsatile secretions of growth hormone. In general, we all have the largest production within the first three to four hours of sleep. That is also tied into circadian rhythm biology that we talked about yesterday and the quality of sleep. Poor sleep quality means poor growth hormone release. So one of the best ways to get patients to have a better growth hormone release is to get them sleeping better. Men have more pulsatile secretions of growth hormone approximately every three hours. What we see with aging and with growth hormone IGF-1 dysfunction is that this becomes blunted. 
instead of it being really low baseline, spiking up high, going down a really low baseline, spiking up high, it actually becomes more like females, where it's a blunted response that occurs a little more frequently than the three hours. So women tend to have a higher baseline than men. So if you actually took a, which it, I never run growth hormone blood tests because it's just not a good test to do. But if you were to run it in a man, you would be barely detectable. And in a woman, you would actually find some. And it's just this fact that women's baseline is higher, but less pulsatile, and men have higher pulsatile, but lower baseline. Thank you.